like uh, David Jonathan Ross and, um, and other people today have, have taken my usual topics of diacritics and extended Latin and indigenous languages. So I needed, I needed to find something else to talk about. Um, soon after the invention of Roman type, an interloper entered the arena, italic. And rather than displacing Roman, it wound its way into our typographic culture and has become an essential part of languages that use the Latin script. Our visual and written communication depends on it, and we get frustrated when that option is not available to us, like, say, on Twitter or something. Yet in all the books that have been written about typeface design, there's often only a handful of pages, if that, on this essential style. So today, I want to explore the roles that italic plays in our typographic culture as a language feature, a typographic element, a historical marker, a design object, and a business product. And see how, the, tell the story of how those roles have shaped the design of italics, from being a strong and independent script to becoming a secondary and subservient style to Roman. A transformation that may have actually opened the door to greater creativity, innovation, and freedom. The first of these five roles is as a language feature. It's part of English and many other languages. It carries specific semantic meaning um, to mimic speech or to emphasize something. It's also used for specific types of content to indicate emphasis, reference, definition, origin, source, or some domain-specific uses, as in chemistry. It's essential to our communication, and I don't use that word essential lightly. Italics mean that the indicated text is somehow different than what's around it. You see, italics can even change the meaning of a word. What about a story? What about a story? Or, I've lost my red slippers, as opposed to, I've lost my red slippers, not my blue ones. Or we're talking about Daredevil, the Marvel Comics superhero character. Or we're talking about Daredevil, the Netflix television series based on the Marvel Comics character. <laughs> right? Those are two different things. And the difference is indicated with italic. Now, printing and style manuals recognize this as early as the 17th century. We've been doing this a long time. Italicization is also often considered a change of content, not layout. It's part of the editorial, not the typesetting process. And fo that follows on from a manuscript tradition of using um, alternate scripts to indicate different kinds of text. And that predates type. Italics, however, are also used as an independent element of typographic design. That's its second role. Here we see it used for a chapter synopsis, a type of metadata. Now, it's very interesting to note that this is different from the italics used elsewhere. You see, in this electronic edition of Winnie the Pooh, the italics in the text are preserved, but not the, for the chapter synopses. Something is different about the nature of those two italics. So italics can have a typographic function of hierarchy, such as section headings, subheadings, side notes, um, navigation, running heads, directions, metadata, like the chapter synopses, but also for purely visual ornament and design, without any particular typographic function. And this comes from the tradition of italics, which started out as a separate script altogether. Italics began as a handwritten style, much like black letter. Niccolo Niccoli and others popularized the style in the early 15th century. It was adopted officially for the writing of papal legal briefs, where speed was an important element. They had long documents to write, and a lot of them, and the the heavy Gothic text that they had been writing documents in the, the bulls took a long time. 
And now we see um, characteristics in this, which we now think of as italics. The upstrokes for diagonal connections, the slight inclination, things that are connected and go hand in hand with speed. So we see the, this style used as connected with a particular type of content. Now the first italic type was cut by Griffo in 1501 at the request of Venetian publisher Aldous Minutius and was used, for, again, for a particular type of content. These were small pocket editions of classical literature. Now, why italic? The common argument is to save space, but the, that's probably actually not the case for a number of reasons which we don't have time to go into. But more likely, the goal was to create a very effective and attractive book and mimic valuable handwritten editions that the market wanted. In other words, it was to sell books. It was to build a reputation. Italic was a popular writing style, still at the time, and one copy of this book, held by the Newbery Library in Chicago, thank you, Newbery, for these images, um, was missing a page. And the page was supposedly ha handwritten by San Vito, one of the writing masters, to, tipped in. Now you can see the similarity with the popular writing style. Um, so what happened here? Griffo got frustrated, because all this took all the credit. And still to this day, you'll see all this credited as the inventor of italic type, when that was not the case at all. It was Griffo. So what did Griffo do? He went down the street to the competitor, Soncino, and said, look, I'll create an italic for you, and I'll create an even better one. And he did. Now, the second style of italic was originated by another writing master, Arrighi, 20 years later. This style, more than any other, influenced what we now know as italic. It was an independent style, like Griffo's, but this time for limited editions of high-class contemporary poetry. And notice the difference in these two types. The ascenders and descenders are much longer and more generous, more florid. Um, there's no concern for space. There's plenty of room. Uh, the text, the type is larger. This is about 16 point, whereas Griffo's was 10 to 12 point. Um, this is because um, the use for generous luxury editions of contemporary poetry didn't need the economy that you needed in the other. And that affected the design. The use affected the design. Italic also began to be used as an alternating typographic element, used for visual design, uh, and it took over from red and black letter for many of these uses. It was used for different types of content on a page, or even within a block of text, as in this dictionary, um, by STN in 1544. Italic was useful. You could even say it was becoming essential to typographers back in the 1540s. Now, about that same time, type founders began to match certain types together, a certain italic with a particular Roman, uh, and the first to expressly connect two in one family, we think, was Guillaume in Antwerp. And we see by this type specimen a matching of sizes. And in the 50 years to follow, people began casting Roman and italic types on the same size bodies, which was, made it a lot easier to put the italic text within a body of Roman text without disrupting the page. Now, the next move towards subordination came 100 years later with the Romain du Roi. And this brought rationalization to type design. Letters constructed on a grid according to abstract principles. And those same principles in grid were applied to the italic. Here we see the beginnings of italics that are designed alongside Romans to match them. This early engraving, which was prior to punch cutting, shows, in fact, a sloped Roman. Um, this was later abandoned in favor of more curved style, but this points in that direction. For the first time, 
the design of the Roman prescribed the design of the Italic. Italic had gone from an independent style to a secondary one. And the changes to the design were driven by changes in use. And that's even true today. If an italic does not fit its purpose by providing enough differentiation, it fails, no matter how elegant or clever it is. Use still wins over creativity, but it doesn't constrain it. All of this leads back to the third role of italic as an essential historical marker. As we've seen, italic is not just one specific style. Even amongst older historic types, we see great variants, from the first types of Griffo and Arrighi um, to the italics of Grandjean, standard for almost 200 years, to the highly rationalized work of Fournier, influenced by the Romain du Roi, to the pointed pen-inspired designs of Didot, now, this doesn't even include italics of the last 150 years, much less things like sans serifs. So even within a very narrow historical window, there are a wide variety of styles. And people who love type study these things as historical artifacts. They're part of the history of type founding and printing. Type designers look at these things for ideas, and such they're used as markers and inspirations for new designs. And often those new designs are described in relation to the old ones that they're inspired by. You see, italic has an inescapable historical nature. Whatever you do, your italic will connect to some historic tradition. In most cases, an italic will follow the same historic tradition as the Roman. Um, in other words, a Baskerville inspired Roman, will get an italic from a similar tradition. Or a Garamond like Roman will get an italic by Grandjean, or something inspired in that direction. Now that connection may be obvious or subtle, and it's true even if you have a humanist sans serif. There is a long history, not going back this far, but still a long history, decades, of interesting sans serif design. And your designs will probably be somewhat influenced by what people have done before. Or, your italic will push away, as far away from tradition as possible, be designed independently, have no direct connection to the Roman initially. And some of the most interesting italics are those that try new things. And the tension is between tradition and originality. A following tradition can be a continuum and has many facets. Does following tradition mean you have to be doing a revival? No, not at all. Um, on the far extreme would be a facsimile, sort of what um, Nick Shin was doing with his Dare 67. Something intended to reproduce the same final printed letter shapes and often the same page layouts. Or, most revivals are really modernizations, like German Premier Pro, an attempt to capture the spirit or intent of the original Grand Jean face. Now, that might involve adapting it to new technology, whether that's offset printing or e-readers or open type. But most italics aren't revivals or modernizations. But they still carry through with echoes of traditional styles. Fournier did this. Going back to the mid-18th century, Fournier mixed tradition with originality. He lived in a strong print culture with very dominant Garamond and Grandjean types. They were the standard. But it was also a few decades after the rationality of the Roman du Roi and the types influenced by it, by Grandjean and Alexandre. And so he sought to stay closely within that genre of rational French types but felt those types had a certain old-fashioned air. So, he wanted to make it better, to make it harmonize better on the page, to bring it closer to the Roman with the top serifs, making it more similar to the fashionable pointed pen style of writing that was popular, 
the, giving it the thick and thin stroke balance that came from that style. Tradition mixed with true originality. The reality is we can't approach type from a clean slate. It's always informed by something. And the Latin script and others have very well-defined patterns and shapes. Eric Gill said we are making existing forms, not inventing new ones. But these are forms. Italics are design objects. They are letter shapes. And that's its fourth role, as a design object. Artifacts that are designed with certain tools and techniques. Now, italic types are not bound to be echoes of older styles. They are unique objects of design with particular characteristics that transcend the historical connections. Now, there are a variety of properties that are commonly associated with italics. Um, the slope or slant inclination skew, the tilting to the right is quite common. But not all italics are tilted. Some are upright. And not all are tilted to the right. Right, Yo? I... <laughs> are you here? <laughs> Italics also tend to be more narrow. They have more calligraphic serifs or entry-exit strokes or terminals, whatever you want to call them. Uh, they're often lighter in weight, not always. Some have more curvature to the strokes, but there are particular italic-style letter forms, particularly of the A and the G, that are commonly used for italics. And italics are most often described, however, as something that slants. Now, some italics are only that here, Avenir. It is a sloped version of the upright. Um, famously, Morrison argued that the sloped Roman was the ideal, even for serif types. But these sloped Romans didn't work well. They didn't provide enough differentiation. Um, and so they failed. And even Morrison later admitted that he pressed his argument too far. So what is at the heart of italic? We've seen some measurable quantities, slant, narrowness, weight, width, things that can be measured. But designers, including Morrison, have also described some more subjective qualities, a sense of cursiveness, of connection, of flow, of movement, of speed, like that original italic of the 15th century, or informality. These subjective properties then result in some objective characteristics. Now, another way to describe the italic object is through the tools that make the shapes. Whether that's a broad nibbed pen, a flexible pen, or a brush, these all come with certain properties and characteristics. But what if the tool is digital? Say, the Bezier curve. Tom Grace mentioned this in his talk yesterday. And you know, we can do almost any shape with the Bezier curve, but there are certain arcs and curves that are frankly plain difficult to do, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so we tend to fall into designing shapes that are more elegant and simple to do with a Bezier curve. The tool is influencing the design. Italic objects are made of tools, and they show those influences. The final role of italic is as a product for sale. In the 16th century, Aldous and Soncino used italic in their trade war. Foundries can compete too. They use italic to promote and sell their typefaces. They can add uniqueness and character to a family. My friends Jose and Vic at Type Together created an unusual upright italic for literata. It was promoted as a way to address certain technical limitations of e-readers, but even they admit that the uniqueness adds to the branding. See, Google needed something unique to compete with Amazon's Bookerly. There's also pressure to create an italic for every weight in your family. You know, you need something to happen when those users hit that I button in Word, right? 
Type jockeys originally had this configuration for their um, lovely family, Ingeborg. But eventually, needed some, add, added in a heavy italic and packaged them this way. It was easier to sell. And I was told a few months ago by a type designer who, who said, you know, I've created some types, that, some faces that ha don't have italics, but, you know, they don't sell. There's pressure. Foundries, even, especially monotype, even used italics to promote other things. Their machines, their technical advances, their claim to historic and academic wisdom. It was a way for them to solidify their reputation as the smart foundry. So italics became showcases. Showcases of academics, of creativity, of technical mastery, of complex, amazing open type, beyond what was even technically required. We saw some more things that these guys did just yesterday, right? These five roles have had a powerful bearing on the design process for italics. We designers, however, rarely talk of them as distinct separate influences. A design may have requirements that span multiple dimensions, and a holistic view of the design process really needs to integrate them together. But this also opens up some design possibilities. Because italics have become secondary with multiple roles and influences, they have more freedom than Roman text faces. You can take more risks. You can have more fun. A fellow designer told me that italics are the reward. They're what you get to do after you've made the upright Roman work. So if you're a type designer, don't let your italics be boring or ineffective. Take advantage of your freedom. Use them to push yourself to a greater creative range. And everyone, don't be satisfied with type families whose italics lack character. These are essential styles in our linguistic and typographic culture and have been there for 500 years. Draw on them to inspire and refresh your designs. Thank you.